the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be now and always acceptable in your sight. O God, our strength and our redeemer. This morning we continue our series, Winning the Game of Life. Board games such as Monopoly and the Game of Life model the ups and downs of everyday living as players travel around the game board. According to these games, being a winner is all about finishing first, having the most money, and being master of the board. Unfortunately, the world is only too quick to reinforce this board game mentality of life. And many people think this is what real life is all about. However, as we all know only too well, life isn't a board game. This six-week series will answer the question, how can we win the real game of life? How can we be active players in a game that pleases God? Fill each square on the board with what matters most. Seek the richness of being instead of having. And win following God's rules instead of the world's. Last week, we began by looking at the object of the game and how real life isn't about acquisition or putting our trust in things, but rather about being rich toward God. This morning, I want to look at how to keep score. Have you ever noticed the first question we ask when we arrive at a game already in progress is, what's the score? Whether it's the game of life, Yahtzee, chess, or Rummy 500, whether it's hockey, soccer, or ping pong, all games involve some kind of scorekeeping. The rules of scoring in any game tells the players which achievements count and what to do in order to win. Monopoly players keep score with money and property. Hockey players count goals and poker players use chips. In most games, players want to score as high as possible. In golf, the lowest score wins. If you think about it, we are by nature scorekeepers. We crave feedback. We want to know how we're doing. Keeping score is really about defining reality. It's the way we determine what counts and what does not. To talk about how we keep score is really to talk about how we define success. As such, our sense of the score exerts a powerful influence over our lives. However, we didn't start out in life inventing a scoring system on our own. We learned it from others. For most of us, the first scorekeepers in our lives were our parents. As small children, we learned to win their smiles, attention, and approval. Perhaps our teachers were next. Report cards are one of the first scorecards a child receives, and one of the ways children learn to keep score. Did you get an A or did you get a B? Others might have been coaches, our peers, and later our bosses, co-workers, and neighbors. The Bible is full of characters who found ways to keep score of their lives. Scorekeeping goes back as far as Genesis 4 with the story of Cain and Abel. Abel's burnt offering found favor with God, but Cain's did not. <clears throat> Genesis 4, 5 reads, This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Cain kept score by comparing his spiritual status with that of his brother, and losing made him mad enough to kill. Jacob had 12 sons who kept score by seeing who was their father's favorite, and we know where that led. Saul was a mighty king. However, one day he returned from battle. He found the women dancing in the streets singing, Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul kept score by the number of kills and popular of opinion. And as we heard last week, the rich fool in Jesus' story kept score using money. As we can see very clearly from these examples, our behavior is often dictated by whatever scoring system we use. And this can have devastating effects on our lives and on the people around us. The world tends to keep score using one of three systems. Number one, comparison. We compare our situations to those who are better off. Upward comparison. We compare ourselves to those at the same level. Lateral comparison. And we compare ourselves to those who are worse off. Downward comparison. Each type carries its own dangers. The first incites envy. The second, competition. And the third, arrogance. 
Regardless of how we compare, it's always self-serving. When it comes to affluence, for instance, we tend to compare ourselves with those just a little better off in the hopes of attaining their level of success. However, this keeps us always wanting more and not thankful for what we have. It also keeps our eyes off people who have less than we do, so we don't think about our need to share. On the other hand, when it comes to morality, we tend to compare ourselves to people we perceive to be lower than us, to make ourselves feel better. I may be bad, but I'm not as bad as Wayne. Number two is competition. This is when we don't just perceive ourselves relative to someone else, i.e. comparison, but also try to best the other. The question being, who is number one? We can become obsessed with this. Am I the best, the fastest, the smartest? Think about it. No sports arena sells a giant foam hand holding up two fingers. It's all about being number one. Comparison isn't a bad thing in itself. Competitors can challenge one another to heights of performance and excellence they didn't know they were capable of. However, competition can also become toxic when it gives rise to envy and jealousy. It can become dark when we're tempted to cheat in order to come out ahead. It can poison the soul when the winner and loser become labels of worth and identity and respect for the battle itself or your component is lost. Number three is climbing. This is all about upward mobility at any cost. If you aren't moving up, you aren't moving. We live in Ladderville, and once you get on one, it's very hard to get off. Ladder climbing is all about me. We look at people higher up the ladder and we feel discontent and we don't bother to look at people lower than us. So we have very little compassion for those less fortunate than ourselves. Preacher John Ortberg tells a story about having lunch with a businessman who was, by almost every scoring system, a very successful man. He was about 50 years old, had been involved in real estate development and was at the top of his game. Ortberg writes, for his entire career, this man had been playing the climbing up the ladder. He knew how to climb the ladder, and he climbed it very well, and every step up was another point. Although this climbing ambition benefited him outwardly, the ladder wasn't good to him. His marriage was on life support. His kids' lives were a mess. He went to church and sat in the same pew every week, but held himself back. No one knew him. He never opened up his heart. Because the truth was, the ladder was his game. The ladder was his family. The ladder was his God. Every time he reached a new rung, he felt a twinge of pleasure. But it never lasted. It always left him wanting more, wanting higher. Unfortunately, he found, as people generally do, that when he got older, the going got a lot slower. The rungs of the ladder got farther apart, and the ladder became crowded. The sad thing was, even though he was a smart guy, he couldn't bring himself to get off the ladder. He was afraid because it was all he knew. Comparing, competing, climbing, that's how the world keeps score. That's how the world determines who wins the game of life. That may be how it's done in the world, but that's not how it is done in the kingdom of God. So how does God keep score? Mark chapter 10 tells the story of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, approaching Jesus and asking that they be given places of honor in his kingdom. Matthew's version has their mummy asking on their behalf. In both cases, it's clear that the sons of Zebedee thought that it was all about comparing, competing, and climbing. They had bought into the world's way of keeping score. As you might imagine, the other disciples got quite upset with their request. They wanted places of honor too and weren't willing to give them up without a fight. In responding to the disciples, Jesus challenges the accepted understanding of the time. Mark 10, 42 reads, You know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you it will be different. Whoever wants to be leader among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. Notice Jesus doesn't reject the notion of greatness, nor the pursuit of it, but rather redefines it. If you want to be great, 
you have to be willing to serve. If you want to be in the front, go to the back. If you want to stand out in life, step down. This went against everything the disciples knew to be true. Yet this is how Jesus lived his life. As we read in Mark 10.45, For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give up his life a ransom for many. As his followers, we are called to live in this same way. Paul writes in Philippians 2.5, Had the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Although he was in the form of God and equal with God, he did not take advantage of this equality. Instead, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, by becoming like other humans, by having a human appearance, he humbled himself. The life of Jesus isn't a picture of somebody climbing up the ladder. It's a picture of someone climbing down through a series of demotions, if you will. To begin with, Jesus was, according to Paul, in very nature God. He was at the top of the organizational chart of the universe. Yet Paul says he didn't consider this to be grounds for grasping. He gave up the right to have things his own way and became a servant. But even angels are servants, so Jesus went lower. He became a human being. He took on flesh and blood. He took on all our needs and limitations. This is the great beauty of the incarnation. God coming down. But even on a human level, some people live as kings and celebrities, so Jesus took yet another demotion. He humbled himself and was born in a stable as the peasant son of a penniless couple. But even that wasn't low enough. And Jesus kept going down by, become, by becoming obedient to death. Jesus' ultimate task wasn't some glorious achievement in the eyes of the world. There's nothing glamorous about death. His demotion didn't even stop there. He went one rung lower, even death on a cross. The problem with spending your lifetime climbing up the ladder is that you will go right past Jesus as he's coming down. Ironically, the moment Jesus looked most like a failure according to the world scoring system was his moment of greatest strength in the eyes of his Father and on the scorecard of heaven. Paul writes, therefore God highly exalted him. In the kingdom of God, score, keeping score isn't about comparing, competing, or climbing. It's all about serving. This concept was radical 2,000 years ago, and it's just as radical today. Rick Warren, author of The Purpose Driven Life, writes, Real servants are always on the lookout for ways to help others. They maintain a low profile and don't promote or call attention to themselves. Instead of acting to impress and dressing for success, they put on the apron of humility to serve one another. If recognized for service, they humbly accept it. But don't allow notoriety to distract them from the work. We can measure our servant heart, our servant heart, by how we respond when others treat us like servants. It's a great point. We can measure our servant heart by how we respond when others treat us like servants. How do you react? when you're taken for granted, bossed around, treated as inferior. Unfortunately, a lot of our service is often self-serving. We serve to get others to like us, to be admired because it makes us feel better, or to achieve our own goals. That's manipulation, not ministry. Warren writes, thinking like a servant is difficult because it challenges the basic problem of life. I am by nature selfish. I think most about me. Whether Warren is correct in this last point or not, we need to ask ourselves, how do I keep score? Do I have a servant's heart? Do I seek to serve others, or am I only looking to serve myself? As Paul tells us in that passage from Philippians, in order to answer this question, we need to look to Jesus. And our reading this morning from John 13 provides not only a powerful picture of what it means to have a servant's heart, but also how scorekeeping works in the kingdom of God. The first characteristic of a servant heart is love. John 13, 1 reads, It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world 
and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. As I've already said, there are many reasons why we serve others, and it's important for us to check our motives. Jesus shows us that true servanthood is always motivated by love. He demonstrated this throughout his ministry, through teaching and preaching, signs, wonders, and miracles, and through his concern and compassion for people. However, as John tells us, when Jesus took the role of a servant and washed his disciples' feet, he showed the full extent of his love, an act that would only be surpassed by his death on the cross. Jesus' motivation to serve was pure. He served out of love and for no other reason. As we read in John 15, 13, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. It's so easy for us to walk through life focusing solely on ourselves. In fact, our culture encourages this. And we can get so busy, overcommitted, and self-involved that we can be like the priest and the Levite in the story of the Good Samaritan and cross over on the other side of the road to avoid someone in need. Not because we're bad people, but because we don't want to get involved. However, when we seek to follow Jesus' lead and look past ourselves, past our own needs, wants, and desires to someone else, we begin to see them as Jesus sees them, as individuals created and loved by God and therefore worthy of our time, attention, compassion, and care. Another reason we need to serve out of love is because our service won't always be appreciated. People who won't won't always happily receive what we offer them. They'll be critical of us, demand something more or different from us, take us for granted and, and not even bother to acknowledge or thank us. If our motivation isn't love, these kinds of attitudes will sour our service pretty quickly. However, if our motivation is love, it doesn't matter how people respond because serving is its own reward. Galatians 5.13 reads, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. What motivates you to serve others? Is it love? Or something else. A second characteristic of a servant heart is strength. Servanthood has gotten a bad rap in our culture. Servants are often viewed as weak and oppressed, easily taken advantage of, and often treated like doormats. Why? Because, as I've already said, our world is overly impressed with the superficial. Our world values externals, how a person looks, their size, shape, and strength. God, however, looks on the inside to the heart. When Samuel was sent to the house of Jesse to anoint one of his eight sons as a new king, he went to the oldest, tallest, strongest, best-looking son first. Eliab may have been Samuel's first choice, but he wasn't God's. Do not look at his appearance or how tall he is, because I have rejected him. God does not see as humans see. Humans look at outward appearances, but the Lord looks into the heart. Humans look at outward appearances, but the Lord looks into the heart. It's what's inside that counts. Jesus shows us that it takes strength, not weakness, to be a servant. According to John, Jesus had strength of direction. John 13, 1 reads, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and go to his Father. It's much easier to serve others when you know where you're going. Servants aren't people who are lost, but rather people who have an internal spiritual compass that says, this is where God is calling me. This is the direction I'm going by God's grace. Number two, Jesus had strength of authority. John 13, 3 reads, Jesus, knowing that God had put all things into his hands. Jesus didn't serve in his own strength or under his own authority, but God's. He didn't need to jockey for power. He didn't need to defend or prove himself. He was totally free to serve because he knew that God was in control. 
that God was the source of his authority and strength. Number three, Jesus had strength of identity. John writes, he knew that he had come from God and was returning to God. Jesus knew where he'd come from and where he was going. He knew who he was and whose he was. Jesus wasn't confused. He had a strong sense of identity and was confident in who he was, no matter what his critics said. If we seek to build our lives on these three things, we will be better able to serve others because we'll be stronger. As we read in Philippians 4.13, For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Jesus knew what was going to happen to him that night as he washed his disciples' feet. However, he didn't allow that to distract him. He didn't say, look, guys, I've got a lot on my plate right now. I'm totally stressed out. It's my night to be pampered. Have you ever noticed how quickly our service to others goes out the window when we're under stress or strain? How quickly we shift our attention from others back to ourselves? Not Jesus. He was confident in who he was and where his strength and security came from. As we read in Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Do you serve out of your own strength or God's strength? Finally, the third characteristic of a servant heart is humility. John writes, Jesus got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was tied around him. Although foreign to us, the act of foot washing was common in Jesus' day. Roads were dirty, and whenever you entered someone's home, it was customary to have your feet washed. However, it wasn't customary for someone of Jesus' status to do the washing. Foot washing was a menial task reserved for the lowest servant, a child. Jesus demonstrates true humility by taking the role upon himself instead of demanding it of others. The Greek word for humility is taponophrosune. Taponophrosune. And literally means to stoop low, to take the lower place, to submit to someone else. Humility isn't very popular in our culture. So often people want the power and the glory but they're not willing to get their hands dirty or to do tasks they consider to be beneath them. Humility, however, is a central characteristic of servanthood. In order to serve others, we need to submit ourselves to them, to stoop low, to put their needs ahead of our own pride. We need to think less of ourselves and more of others. As we read in Philippians 2, verses 3 to 4, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility... Regard others as better than yourselves. Look, each of you, not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. It's interesting that none of the disciples volunteered to be the foot washer. The upper room was filled that night with proud hearts and dirty feet. Sadly, the disciples were willing to fight for the throne, for places of honor in Jesus' kingdom, but no one was willing to fight for the towel. And whether we admit it or not, we need this lesson in humility because without it, we will never be able to serve as Jesus served. Jesus says in Matthew 23, 12, all who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. How about you? Are you going to be exalted or humbled? The reality is we are all scorekeepers. The question is, how do we keep score? According to the world's rules or God's? James and John, the sons of Zebedee, got it wrong. They thought keeping score was all about comparing, competing, and climbing. However, that's not how it works in the kingdom of God. This morning, we are reminded that as followers of Jesus, keeping score is all about being a servant. In washing his disciples' feet, Jesus sets an example for us. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Foot washing is a metaphor for servanthood. 
And Jesus is showing us that if the Son of God could humble himself and serve, we must do the same. How do you keep score? Like the world, like James and John, or like Jesus? Do you have a servant's heart? Jesus says, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Amen.